you would all please stand through to honor the, the reading of the word of God. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We declare this morning that your word is life to those who find it. Thank you for the word that led us to you. Thank you for the word that keeps us in you. Thank you for your word, God, that is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray this morning, God, wash over this place in the precious blood of Jesus. I pray, God, draw our hearts and our minds to you today. Be the center of this place. Hide me behind your cross. Let your word be spoken with truth. Let it be spoken with clarity. And let your anointing rest on me this morning that I could be and do what you've called me to do. We thank you for it. Bless each person today. Let your word not only be good to us, but let it challenge us and change us to be good for you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And we give you all the honor. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen. Matthew chapter 5. Verses 13 through 16. It says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how then shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill, a city that is set on a hill, cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But they put it on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If we could turn now to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus said here, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So I want to talk this morning, we were speaking last week about how to be a contagious Christian. Okay? How to be a contagious Christian. I just think it's very fitting right now for what's going on, you know, <laughs> that we look at something else that's contagious. Christianity should be contagious. People should see the good works in our lives. They should see the things that we do and they should want to be like us. So this morning, I wanted to summarize this first part of our message. It's the prerequisite of high potency. The prerequisite of high potency. We want our lives to be potent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a verse and a passage where it talks about a, a fragrance going up to God. And listen, when we're pleasing the Lord, when we're doing what God has called us to do, when we're living and serving Him, there's a fragrance that goes up. When we sacrifice ourselves for God, when our lives, when we're going through hard times, right, and the hard times are breaking us, and the hard times are challenging us, but we choose to submit ourselves to the will of God in those times, what happens is there's a breaking that happens, there's a crushing that happens, and we know that there's a process with olive oil. The anointing oil they used to use in the temple, it had to go through a three times crushing. Come on, somebody. It had to be crushed three times. It had to be pressed three times because that's how you get the purity out of it. The Bible talks about what happens to us when the heat is turned up in our lives. The fire in that burns out the impurities. As a welder, I can see it. I can see what happens. The hotter you turn the heat, I'm sure Lenny knows, the more you burn out. And what happens if you don't get the impurities out, you're still left with a weld that can look okay. But if you put an x-ray on it and look at the inside of it, it's rotten. It's porous. It has holes in it and weak spots. And it won't hold up under pressure. One of the ways they used to test our welds is when you would do a weld, they do these things called coupons. And they have these two beveled edges on them. And you have to burn and fill in the coupons. And they'd come through with an x-ray and find the weakest spot. And they'd put it in a press. And they'd press down against the base of the weld. And then they'd flip it over and press down against the back of the weld. And if your weld busted, you failed. You'd have to go test again. So it's important that we understand that God is bringing us to a place where we can be pressed both ways and we won't break. We can be pressed both ways 
Pressed but not crushed. Persecuted, not abandoned. Come on, somebody. Struck down but not destroyed. Struck down but not destroyed. So this morning, Matthew 5 talks about being salty. Come on, somebody. Say, I want to be a salty Christian. <laughs> Come on. I want to be a salty Christian. What does salt do? What is salt good for? Right? Salt's good for a lot of things. It's a tenderizer. That's right. I remember the olden days when they used to smoke meats. You had to do it on the shrinking of the moon. You couldn't do it on the swelling of the moon because the swelling of the moon, the meat would spoil. The shrinking of the moon, it would pull the flavor in. Preserving, exactly. It's used to preserve things. It's also used to stimulate thirst. It makes us thirsty. So the salty Christian should make people thirsty. People should thirst for what we have. They should want what we have. You know, that's the old trick of the bars. They used to put the salt and nuts in there. Why? Because it makes you thirsty. What happens when you're thirsty? You drink. Yeah, hopefully some water. So what was Jesus referring to when he said that his Christians were to be the salt and light of the earth? Was he referring to preservation? Was he referring to seasoning and flavor? Was he referring to thirst? We may never know, but I believe he was talking about all three. I believe that he's calling us to be salty in such a way that it preserves us, that we're preserved in him. But at the same time, we're bringing flavor. People see that. Listen, I'm telling you, you get up to broken people and you start ministering to them. You start loving on them. You start serving them. They want what you have. They want what you have. It's not about cramming it down their throat. Right. It's about living in such a way that it draws them. Right. It draws them in. It seems like he was referring to all three. So I want to talk about a few things this morning that will help us be a contagious Christian, okay? The first thing is high potency. We need to be potent. We need to have a fragrance about us. There needs to be something different in the way that we walk, something different in the way that we talk. Something different in the way that we act that brings people to us. The second thing is close proximity. We want to have relationships. We want to keep people close to us. Who do we want to keep close to us? Well, we want to keep the church close to us. Obviously, that's a given. We want to keep our brothers and sisters close to us. Why? Because we need the fellowship. We need the support. We need the challenge of being around people. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. You know, an axe that isn't used will just rust and pit. But when an axe is polished against another axe, when iron is against iron, it stays in such a way that it's stronger, it's clean. The last thing is clear communication. The message that we preach, I think there's no greater time now in history that the world needs to see a clear message of what we believe. Not a forceful. Now listen, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is advancing and the forceful people take it. So that does mean that we have to be rigid in what we do. But it needs to understand what we do. So clear communication. Clear communication. Now when these things work together, it produces maximum impact. It produces change. Not only change in us, which is where it all has to start, right? It all has to start right here. And then it comes upon. It comes up out of us and onto those around us. So what does salt do? We talked about that. Now, what does light do? What does light do? It does. It removes darkness. Light also exposes darkness. It shows us where the shadows are. It shows us where the things are. Listen, you know what? Specifically in ourselves, light shows us where the shadows are. It shows us the defects. I was waxing my car yesterday and cleaning the windows. And I scrubbed the windows down. They looked really good until we got out of the right light. And in the right light, it was streaked. And I said, well, i got to clean it again. Looking around the car, when you're waxing a car in the right light, you can see all those little defects, all those little things, all those little scratches. They drive me nuts when I see a little OCD on it. But um, it, it really does. The different types of light will show us. And that's the importance of, of the word. I remember my uncle talked about, uh, Uncle Joel, he talked about buying a car. He went to a car dealership, and it was a truck. And he said at nighttime, that truck was shiny. It was gorgeous. And 
He said, because of how good it looked, he bought. And then he got up the next morning in the sunlight, and he found out the whole paint was faded, and the guy had literally polished the outside of the truck motor oil. Couldn't tell it at night. Takes the right light to expose, right? Takes the right light to show us things. It shows what needs to be addressed. A lot of things can be hidden in darkness. Come on, somebody. Light makes them visible. For a Christian, it's used to illuminate the truths of Scripture. This is the reason why Scripture is so important to us. This is the reason why Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. It's through obedience that the light of the Lord comes into our lives. The light of the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And then he begins to show us, hey, listen, this is off. This needs to be addressed. This is off. This needs to be addressed. The more that we submit ourselves to the word of God and to the will of God, the more light that's in our lives, the more that we see things that are wrong, the more that we see things that need to change, sometimes that makes us want to stay in darkness. Why? Because it's difficult to let the Lord expose things in our lives. It's difficult for him to show us. It's painful. But the Bible says the Lord disciplines those he loves. He chastises those that he cares about. That's a good father. People say nowadays that a good father is one who holds back. No, a good father is one who pushes forward. A good father is one who's willing to tell the truth now to avoid a problem in the future. Aren't you glad we got a good father this morning? And aren't you glad he doesn't lord it over us? Aren't you glad that when he disciplines us, he disciplines us and chastises us out of love? Because he's trying to produce something in us that can't be produced otherwise. In order for us to fulfill, in order for light to fulfill its purpose, okay, it must not be covered up. A city on a hill can't be hidden, no matter what you do. I think about going up north in New Hampshire. And when you go around the lakes region, every once in a while you'll see a house up on a hill. Now the other ones down below, they're all hidden. They're all covered up. Sometimes it's Christians who want to be hidden, who want to be covered up. Why? Because it's, it's, sometimes it's confrontational. Sometimes people get upset. Sometimes people judge. You know, you make a slip up, what's the first thing people say? Oh, my God. Oh, there you go, Christian. Right? But listen, that's not the person that's attacking you. That's the spirit that's in them. Right. It's not the person. We have to understand this. And when they do that, listen, shine on. Don't let it quench your light. Don't let it quench your fire. Don't let it take away your flavor and your zeal. Stay encouraged. Remember, I'm going to give another brief story. Uh, this is a, an individual who just passed away recently. He's one of my leaders, a great man of God. And he talked about when he used to be a merchant marine. This is in regards to light. He was in the bowels of a ship. And I don't know if there's miles the way they designed them in those big ships. He was a merchant marine on one of the larger oil vessels. And he said that there's miles of tunnels. And he got in those tunnels and his flashlight went out. Pitch black. And he said, you've never seen pitch black. He's right. I've never been in a position where there was absolutely no light. There's always been just a little. He said, listen, no light at all. And he was trying to figure out what was going to happen because he was dying. It takes somebody forever to find him. There's so many different tunnels and entryways that you can go through. And he said he was sitting there trying to figure out how he was going to get out. And they remembered he had a Timex on. And so he took his Timex and he pushed the little button on it. You might not be able to see it right now, but on my watch it lights up. And he said, listen, when it's pitch black, it only took a little bit of light. It only takes a little bit of light to make a difference. Aren't you glad we have a lot of light? He used that Timex to get out. It showed him how to get out of that ship. I'll never forget that story. Matthew 15, or 5, 15 and 16. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a lampstand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. I like bright lights in my house. I like to be able to see. Nicole turns the lights off all the time. And then I come back and turn them all on again. Because I like to be able to see, you know. I, I like to be able to see what's going on. So Romans 10, 14, it says, How can then they call on one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one they've not heard about? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they hear without someone sharing with them? In order to give our faith away, 
We must get close to those who need to hear the message of hope and forgiveness found in Jesus. How do we give our faith away? We don't give our faith away by congregating here. We get refilled here. We get what we need here. We encourage one another. We love on one another. Listen, it's so good to be in fellowship with Christians. It's so good to see you this morning. It is. It's great to see you this morning. It encourages me. It fills me to be around other Christians. We worship together. Something changes in us. But we have to understand that this is not glory. We can't just worship all the time. There's a job to do. We're called to reach this world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're called to make an impact in people's lives. That's why God has chosen us. That's why God has called us. This is just the benefit. The celebration, the refilling of the Holy Spirit is just a benefit. The way that it feels is just a benefit because it doesn't always feel good. There's biblical examples of the fact that we have the potential of close proximity. Keeping people close who need Jesus. Okay? Keeping people close who need Jesus. Close proximity. Zacchaeus is an example. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, it says, Then Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was very wealthy. He wanted to see Jesus, but being a short man, or a man of short stature, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Listen, do you understand? He knew by the way that Jesus lived. He knew by who Jesus was that this was going to make an impact in his life. And he welcomed Jesus into his home. He said, come, come. Why would you sit with a sinner? Why would you sit with me? Why would you love me? Why would you serve me? Why would you want anything to do with me? Aren't you a Christian? Yes, I am, but I love you. Absolutely, I am. And I love you. All the people saw this, and they began to mutter. Here we go now. He's gone to be a guest of a sinner. Yes, he has. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and I have cheated anybody out of anything. I will repay them four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man did not come for the healthy, but he came to seek and save that which was lost. Amen. Another example is Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. And Jesus went on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he said to him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at my house, or Matthew's house, Many tax collectors and sinners came. Guess what? Many tax collectors, many sinners came. Are we contagious? Do people want to be around us? Do they see the difference? Do they see the work of God in our lives? Does it draw them to us? Does it bring them? Not to us. Here's the thing. God just wants to use us to bring people to him. And when our lives are reflecting the sun, there's something about that that makes people thirsty. It makes them hungry. How many times have I told you about how Wilton and the lifestyle that he lived when I watched him every day, the things that would drive me down and the things that I just couldn't deal with. And to him, it was just, just rolled right off. There was a genuineness, a joy, and a peace. And I was so hungry for that. I would have done anything. I did do anything. Anything I could get my hands on, anything the world said, this will make you happy. This will bring you peace. I poured out all of my energy, all of my strength, jobs, money, drugs, alcohol, to drown what was in me. And then I saw something that was real. When the Pharisees saw this, when they saw the tax collectors coming, right? When they saw the sinners coming and eating with the disciples, it says... 
What is your teacher? Eat with tax collectors and sinners. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy. For I have come to call the right, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. When God has done, thing, done something in your life, when he has saved you, it's such a pitfall for us as Christians to lord that over people. To think that puts us on a pedestal above them. To think we have the right to tell people how to live. To think that we have the right to tell people what's wrong in their lives. The Bible says first we got to get the plank out of our eye before we can even think about touching a splinter. Right. It's about mercy. It's about grace. It's about loving people where they are. Listen, I know that someone from this church told me about how he got saved. He was invited to a Bible study. He said, I won't come unless I can drink and smoke. If I can drink and smoke, I'll come. Some people say that's a bad idea. Listen, praise the Lord he came. After six months of drinking every time and smoking every time, the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. He got set free from alcohol. He got set free from cigarettes, and God changed his life. Imagine if that had never happened. Imagine if they were too good for that. People are hurting. People are broken. You don't know where a person's been. You don't know what they've been through. And they need Jesus. And how will they hear unless we tell them? How will they know unless we show them? You can't expect a person to change. There's another guy that I was listening to. He said his wife passed away. And he went into church and he was broken. Lost her 20-some years of marriage. And he said, I was in there and the worship leader said, Man, I wish somebody would praise the Lord this morning. You look like you got nothing to give. And he said, I don't have anything to give. I lost everything. And he said, don't expect me to praise in your pew when you haven't hurt with me in my home. It's a sacrifice. The next example is a sinful woman. We all know about this one, right? Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. But when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair and she kissed them. And she poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he was a prophet, he would know who was touching him. Don't touch me. I don't want to get contaminated with your sin. I don't want to get contaminated with the stuff that's on you. Keep your distance. Hmm. Jesus answered him, and he said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. He said, two men owed money, and a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose, the one who had the bigger debt. It was canceled. Jesus said, you've judged correctly. And then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you didn't give me water for my feet. But she washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then the other guests began to say to themselves, who is this who can even forgive sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's the power of the gospel. Then we have the woman at the well, John 4, 1 through 26. It says, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had, a, he had to go through Samaria. 
And so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. I love Jesus. I love that he comes in and he breaks down all those barriers. He breaks down age. He breaks down race. He breaks down all of it. Jesus answered to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, said the woman, you have nothing to draw, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and even drank from it himself? As did his sons and his flocks and herds. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will never be thirsty again. Or everyone who drinks this water, the well water, will be thirsty again. Right? That's why I smashed three bottles of water a sermon. <laughs> Still thirsty. It's an unquenchable thirst. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I will give become a spring of water, welling up into eternal life. Not a temporary fix. Come on, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah, but an eternal fix. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. That should do something to us, man. It's eternal. It's not going to pass away. It's not going to die. It's not going to end. The well never runs dry. We can drink and drink and drink from the well of Christ. And our thirst will be quenched and satisfied over and over and over again. It says we'll never even thirst again. Why? Because there's nothing that compares with Jesus. There's nothing that can do what he can do. Nobody, nowhere can do what Jesus does. Amen. Hallelujah. The woman said, Sir, give me this water that I won't be thirsty and have to keep coming here for water. He told her, You go and call your husband. Ouch. And come back. I have no husband, she replied to Jesus. And Jesus said to her, you're right to say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five. And the man that you're with now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true, she responded. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman. A time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet there is a time coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He knew what was coming. Hallelujah. He knew the Holy Ghost was coming. He promised it, and he fulfilled it. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Ghost this morning? Amen. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Listen to Jesus' response. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Amen. See, when you speak the gospel, when you live the gospel, it changes people. Jesus maintained a close proximity with those who needed the gospel the most. Tax collectors, cheats, swindlers, liars, right? Prostitutes, adulterers, right? Now that doesn't mean to go get in somebody's face and say you're an adulterer, right? Listen, when you're living the right way, they'll come to you. And they'll begin to ask you and talk to you about what's going on in their lives. When you build that relationship and they realize that you're not judging them, that you're loving them, the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged. This is a gospel that's not preached in the church all that much. 
we start looking at other people's lives and looking at other people's fruit, and what happens is we miss the mark in our own lives. We got to get busy looking at ourselves, looking at our own lives. And when we look at people, we got to see them for who they are. Jesus, check this out now, he didn't compromise who he was. He never ever sacrificed his integrity. He didn't stoop down. Listen, sometimes I feel like we can have this thing in our mind that says, well, if I, if I just have one drink with them, you know, if I just do this one thing with them, maybe I can reach them better. On the contrary, Jesus proved that the only way to reach them is to not compromise your own integrity. We can't give someone else a license to sin. If it causes your brother to stumble, don't do it. It's just that simple. That should answer all those questions in our minds and our lives. Right? Should answer all those questions in our minds and in our lives. Amen. Amen. And I received that. He didn't compromise. He never sacrificed his integrity. Now listen, he called it like it is. He told the truth. And the truth that he was the Messiah and he came to seek and save that which was lost. That's what brought people to change. He led by example. He allowed the power of God to work through him as a conduit. Now the light of his life exposed the things in other people's lives and hearts that needed to change. But through the life that he lived, it actually brought people to God. The church was not meant to be out of the world. We weren't ever meant to live outside of this place. Now listen, we're here no matter what. We've got to take as many people as we go, when we go. Forcing somebody to accept Christ, it doesn't work. It produces a false narrative. It produces a false reality. And what happens is, they eventually will drift away. Why? Because it's not real. It's not solid. It has to be a true foundation. It has to be a solid stone. Otherwise, when time comes, the Bible says the waves will beat against the house, and the winds will come, and the foundation will crumble. It needs a solid foundation of truth. It has to be true, and it has to be accepted. The person has to be willing to accept it. Listen, we can't compromise the gospel just for the sake of winning a soul. That's cheap. It's artificial. It's not real. The gospel is the gospel. Right? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. That's the truth. But why would people want to follow us? Do people want to follow us? Are we contagious with the way that we live, with our lifestyles? We can't be afraid of being around people who don't share the same views or beliefs. Instead, we need to be focused on loving them and living the gospel out before their eyes, sharing the word, being prepared in season and out of season. Always season, in season and out of season. There's barriers to building relationships. There's difficulties to building these relationships. Here's some examples of some biblical issues. Some difficulties in building these types of relationships. James 4, 4 through 10, it says, You're an adulterous people. You don't know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that Scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? It's jealous. The Spirit of God is jealous. Listen, it's not jealous of you. It's jealous for you. It's jealous for your attention. The Holy Ghost is jealous for your attention. He desires it intensely. But He gives us more grace. That's why the Scripture said God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a promise. You've got to remember this now. When temptation comes... The Bible says resist, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You can take that to the bank. Temptation says I can't. Your flesh says you can't, but this says you can't. The word of God says you can't, and it's true. I remember a friend of mine, and uh, he's a teen challenge boy too. 
and he told me this story about how um, he was out of Teen Challenge on a home pass, or he was away on a vacation or something. He was in a hotel, and you know, it's you're an ex-drug addict. You live the whole lifestyle of that with with women and alcohol and drugs, and uh, it was his first time really being away from home. And he said this woman got in the elevator. She was very scantily clad, right? And you could tell what she was looking for. And he said, what floor are you going to? And she said, whatever floor you're on. And he said, no, you're not. And she said, yes, I am. And he said, no, you're not. And she said, oh, yes, I am. And he said, I don't think you understand me. No, you're not. When he said it the third time, the door opened up and she left and never saw her again. Imagine, resist, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He'll come back, but he'll flee again. It's up to us to keep him at bay. It's our decisions. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Aren't you grateful this morning when we draw near to God? He draws near to us. One of my favorite verses. Tito Efron Santos used to say, Chalatan. Spanish guy, Jalata, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Are we double-minded this morning? Are we in love with the world and in love with God? Because it can never be that way. Right. Abraham Lincoln was a great president. I'm sure you've heard this speech before. He said, a house divided won't stand. It's either all or none. You go to Revelations and it talks about a lukewarm Christian. He says you're lukewarm. You're half-hearted. And what does he say he'll do? He'll spew mouth. you out of his mouth. Exactly. It says grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Some Christians would like to live a worldly life and live however they want, do whatever they want. But this is one of the reasons we're not seeing the lost saved. This is one of the reasons we're not seeing broken lives healed. We're in this world, but we're called to be ambassadors of another world. Called to live in, but separate ourselves from the systems of this world. Don't compromise your lifestyle for the sake of someone else. In doing so, the mind and the flesh may tell you that you're winning them. But what you're winning is a false gospel. It's a false truth. And it will produce no life. It will produce no change. It will produce no fruit. Because then the person says it's okay to compromise. They don't see the actual gospel. They don't hear the actual gospel. We're called to be in the world, but separate ourselves from the system of the world. What does the Bible say about us? It says we're a peculiar people. We're strange. We're oddballs. Right? right? Bunch of odd ducks. We're called a royal priesthood and a holy, a holy nation. Excuse me. A royal priesthood and a holy nation. Holy. We talked about that about a month and a half ago. How holy means set apart. The things of God are holy. They're set apart. They can't be tainted. It is what it is. We don't have to like it. But hopefully when we begin to do it, and not even hopefully as we begin to do it, we begin to see and experience the power of God in our lives and it draws us to be holy. It brings us to want to please God. Why? Because he's so good. He's so good. Isn't God good? All the time. Amen. And all the time, God is good. God is good. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it says, Love not the world, neither the things of the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What a powerful statement. Jesus says if we love the world, then we don't love God. Fact. That's a definitive line. There's no gray area. There's no area where we can say, you know what, I'm just going to be like right here between this step and this step. I'm going to like hang in this little spot right here. This is where I'm going to operate. Not too worldly, not too Christian, right? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh 
and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. The lust of the eyes is never satisfied. What does that mean? That means if I see something that I'm really attracted to, then listen, I'm going to drink my fill of that, and I'm still going to be thirsty. The lust of the eyes is never satisfied. The lust of the flesh is never satisfied. One Pringle is never enough. <laughs> Once you pop, the fun don't stop, right? You just got to keep going with them. Oreo cookies are my weakness. I love Oreos. Nicole will tell you, listen, I will smash a whole box of Oreos in one sitting if I don't exercise some self-control. And guess what? When I'm done with that, I'm not satisfied. I'm definitely not satisfied. I feel like garbage, actually. It makes me feel worse until I go back and smash another box. And then I feel even worse, right? The love of the Father is not in him. And when the world is going to pass away and the lust thereof, Listen, the world is not eternal. The world, all these things that we invest ourselves in, they're going to pass away. The love of the world. But he that does the will of God abides forever. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has, the boasting of what he does, it doesn't come from the Father, but from the world. The world. And its desires pass away. But the man who does the will of God lives forever. Listen, everything that we have is fleeting. I can, the stuff that I've lost, the people that I've lost, jobs, cars, money, relationships, just stuff. It's just stuff. There's nothing wrong with stuff. I love stuff. I really enjoy stuff. I want more stuff. I like my stuff, right? But my stuff doesn't define me. Our stuff can't define us. The moment that our stuff takes the place of God, we've replaced eternal with temporal. And that means that it will never satisfy. That's the reason why people are so, they're so confused. They don't know what they want. They don't know what they need. They go from the next thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. And it never satisfies. It just creates a thirst for something else. And then the next thing comes, and the next thing comes. There's only one thing that's eternal. And that's Him. And the Bible says when we do the will of God, we'll live forever. It's not a cliche statement. People don't agree with it. People choose not to believe it. It's unfortunate that they do. We've won the lottery. We literally have won the lottery. People sometimes get upset when we try to share the gospel with them because they don't understand. Remember, there was a guy I used to talk to in Maryland, and he would say, you're yelling at me. And I'm like, I'm not yelling at you, man. I'm just excited. I just got to tell you what's going on in my life. I got to tell you who my God is. He's like, stop yelling at me. I was like, I'm not yelling at you, man. You know, I probably was, but I wasn't trying to, right? It's just excitement about what God is doing and what he's done. James 1.27 says, that religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless in this, to look after orphans, to look after widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. What happens when we're polluted, right? The Bible says it becomes a form of godliness, but it lacks the power. John 17, 13 through 19 I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world. So that they may be, oh, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word. And the world has hated them. For they are not of the world. More than I am of the world. My power is not that you take them out of the world. For my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they true, they too may be truly sanctified. There's no greater love than a man laid on his life for his friend. There's no greater love than when we lay down our lives. We give up our desires 
for the sake of reaching others. We want to be Christians until it hurts. And when it hurts, we draw back. We retreat. And while we retreat, the enemy advances. Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Baal or Baal or Belial? What does the believer have in common with the unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, and God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Were God's people supposed to mix with the world? When they built the temple, the tent of meeting, what happened? I mean, listen, you, you see it, what happened every time they got mixed up. Every time. It was more than just something bad. I mean, God wanted no part of them. He was going to wipe them off the face of the earth time and time and time and time again. He actually did it one morning in time. Yeah. Destroy everything. Thank you, Lord, for the rainbow. Thank you, Lord, for the rainbow. He also did it in Moses, too, when he was on the mountain and he came down. Yep. I will live them and walk among them. I will live with them and walk among them and be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out of them. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing, and I will receive you. Now listen. It doesn't mean don't be around them. It doesn't mean... Don't be with them. Be with them, but don't compromise. Don't change who you are for the sake of someone else. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is the enemy trying to deceive you and trying to weaken your witness. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because the enemy roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It only starts with one compromise. It only starts with one, and it is. Oh, it's just a little thing. Just a little thing. I'm just a little bit here. The Bible says a little yeast spoils the whole loaf. The Bible says the small foxes spoil the vine. Why? Small foxes nip at the bottom. And then the whole rest of the plant dies. It's the small things. It's the little things. Therefore come out of them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no one clean thing. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. I've written to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not all, meaning the people of this world are who, who are immoral. Or not at all, meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy, or the swindlers, or the idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a swindler, a drunkard. With, with such a man, do not even eat. He's talking about here. This one's about us. He's addressing a church in this letter, the church of the Corinthians. He's saying, listen, someone in the church who claims to be a brother, someone in the church who claims to be a sister, but they're living in these ways, get away from them. Because they'll pull you down. They'll pull you down. We know these people are in the world. Now listen, it doesn't mean that we have to go shack up with them. <laughs> Come on, somebody. It doesn't mean that we have to be around them all the time. Listen, our job is to love them and to lead them to Jesus by example. Luke 7, 35, 34 through 35. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. The fruit of what we produce tells the tree that we are. That's a tough one. But that's the truth. And that's not directed at anybody else. That starts with me. The fruit that I produce in my home, 
That starts with Nicole. The fruit that she produces in her home, that proves us right. By the way that we live, it proves us right. We are proved by our children. Now listen, there's a spiritual danger. But we can't overplay the spiritual danger either. The Bible says that we can be so spiritually minded that we're no earthly good. What does that mean? We're always walking around in the spirit. Always in the spirit. Listen, you're a flesh and blood person. Yeah, you got the spirit in you. Absolutely. And listen, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you, but make sure it's the Holy Ghost. It's so easy to be deceived. We see people all the time, man. And listen, we had a, oh man, we had a guy come in and uh, he's on storefront up in some place and, and he's just going crazy. Wanting to pray for everybody. Some of the people didn't want to be prayed for. That's fine. You know, there are times when it needs to be forceful. But the Holy Spirit will let you know what's going on. Hmm. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. But wisdom is proved by, by our children. So spiritual danger, it's important for us to know and understand. But don't be so spiritually minded that you're no earthly good. Sometimes good advice is just good advice. Not, not all that spiritual. Sometimes it's just good common sense. Aren't you glad God allows us to have a brain? Yeah. Right? Aren't you glad the brain works really well? It functions really well. Listen, I, I heard of a church that went to minister in Africa. And when they got there, there was a tribe that the husbands had multiple wives. But they wanted to follow God. They genuinely, with all their hearts, wanted to serve God. So they said, what must we do? And the church said, get ready your wives. And get rid of the children that you have with them. It's not good common sense. Listen, they were married to their wives. They were serving their wives. They were loving their wives. Now listen, they can tell their children, we were wrong. They can lead by example by continuing to honor the fact that they were in covenant with their wives. What happened was the, the women got sick and died. The children got sick and died. The people turned against God. They said, what kind of a God would do this? What kind of a God would do this? Listen, love people where they are. Teach them the right way. You know? Don't throw people to the side. Love people. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 through 34. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I got an old buddy of mine. He says, you hang around a barbershop long enough, you get a haircut. You hang around ducks long enough, you start quacking. Who are we keeping our company with? Come back to your senses. You ought to stop or come back to your senses as you ought to and stop sinning. For if there are some who are ignorant of God, I say, this is your shame. What does that mean? That means that that's on us, it's not on them. How we affect those around us is on us. Oftentimes we want to pass that blame off. Can't be that way. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says, For we ought to walk and live in the world, but we don't wage war as the world does. What does this mean? It means that we're not fighting against each other all the time. Man, we, we everything becomes an attack against us and an attack against them, and this person did this, and this person did that. And we don't wage war that way. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they're divine with power to demolish strongholds. The reason some of us are, are still wrestling with strongholds, the reason that some of us still have strongholds in our lives, maybe we're waging war the wrong way. Maybe. I'm not saying we are. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. What does that mean? If we find a thought that's in opposition to the, to the Word of God, we hold that thing hostage. We grab a hold of that thing and say, hey, you're not supposed to be here. What are you doing here? Get out of my life. I can't live that way because this says otherwise. I can't do that because this says otherwise. We bring and we demolish every argument, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Listen, that means that you can. That means that I can. Some of those arguments say that you can't. Make it obedient. You ever talk to yourself? Yeah. All the time. You can do this, right? You can do this. Yeah. 
because the Bible tells me that I can. The Word of God speaks otherwise. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's why I've got a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So here's the thing. Risking your reputation. Ah. It's quiet. Uh -huh. Luke 7.34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Reputation in the church sometimes. You know, sometimes the church can be the most vicious place. What happens is there's wolves that sneak in. Not for the purpose of giving life, but the purpose of devouring sheep. you got to know, it's, the church is not exempt. And some people say that's the reason why they don't go to church. It's not an excuse. It's not an excuse. There's no excuse for not being around other believers. You know, you're going to have it out there. What makes you think you're not going to have it in here? Right. But listen, it doesn't justify us being that way. We're called to be different than that. We are called. I am called to be different than that. Matthew 9, 12 through 13. It says, on hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. Personal discomfort. So how do I do this? How do I maintain close proximity? Involve people in your everyday activities. Invite people to go with you. Why do we do that? Listen, that's accountability for you. You got somebody watching you, it makes you change what you do. Ooh. Well, we always have somebody watching us. Don't do that. Well, yes, we do. Yeah. I'm talking about us, though. Oh. And knowing that a physical person, someone who needs Jesus, is watching the way that we live all the time. They got, they got their eye on you. See it all the time. Hear it all the time. So where do I start, right? We involve people in our everyday activities. Where do I start doing this? Listen, people that you used to know, think about them. Start reaching out to them. Invite them to come with you. First thing we try to do is get people to come to church. They don't want to come because they don't know you. They don't have a relationship with you. They don't trust you. They don't trust me. I haven't taken the time to build the relationship first. First thing we always say is, hey, come to church. Come to church. No. Nope. Listen, just have a regular conversation with somebody. It's not that hard. Find something that you agree on. Talk to them. Witness to them. Minister to them through your love for them. It takes time. It takes time. We think that it's an instantaneous thing, and then we get so down, downtrodden and defeated when we don't see the change taking place, when we don't see them you know, wanting to change. But here's the thing. It requires me to change. I'm the one who's supposed to change. And through the change in my life, it's a ministry to those around me. It's a testimony to those around me. When they see your good works, the Bible says, and they'll glorify God. Wow. How did you do that? How do you do this? It's Jesus Christ, folks. And then they can't deny it. Amen? Amen. People you would like to know. Take a moment and get out of yourself and reach out to somebody that you'd like to get to know. Develop a relationship with them. Talk with them. Amen. Find out what their needs are. And then develop a relationship in prayer over them. Pray for them. Pray that God would draw them. Pray that God would touch them. Pray that God would make himself real to them. Colossians 4, 2 through 6, it says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Pray for us too. That God may open the door for our message, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. This is when he was arrested and in jail. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I think about a time, so I'm talking about being too salty. We'll be wrapping up here in just a minute. Talking about being too salty, okay? When I was a kid, I was at my grandma's house, and she got some fresh cucumbers out of the garden and brought them inside. They were delicious. And I used to salt my cucumbers. Well, I got talking while I was salting my cucumber. And uh, 
just sprinkling the salt on, and I was talking, and everybody was paying attention to me. I thought they were listening to my story. They were watching how much salt I was putting on that cucumber. And by the time I was done, I had a mountain of salt that tall on it. And when I bit that thing, my word, you talk about puckering up. Listen, if we're too salty, if we come in full bore, what happens? Nobody wants to be a part of that. Why? You're crazy. You're a nut job. And they're right. They're not wrong. That's the thing. We, we think that it's them. Well, you're just wrong. You just don't understand. No. Oh, they understand completely. You're crazy. You don't have to be crazy to be a Christian. Just be who you are. Use what God has given you. If he's given you the ability to love, love people, then love them. If he's given you the ability to encourage people, encourage them. Don't tear them down. There's enough stuff. This whole world's tearing people down. The whole world's telling them what's wrong and how to fix it. Just problem after problem after problem. Don't be a problem, be a solution. You have the answer. I have the answer. Hallelujah! Problem solved. Let your conversation always be full of grace. 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 Find the approach that fits you. Be yourself. Peter had a confrontational approach. Hit it head on. Let's take an ear right off. Right? Paul's intellectual approach. He appealed to the intellect of people. Hey, think about this, man. Take a look at yourself. Look inside yourself. The blind man's testimonial approach. John chapter 9, verse 25 through 27. He replied, what is, or whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, he was blind. Wait, hold on. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that I was blind, and now I see. They told him that Jesus was a sinner. Then they asked, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become disciples too? He testified, even when they tried to shut him up. Listen, you get somebody who's in addiction, they can argue with you on some things. But when you tell them the power of God set you free, the gospel and the Holy Spirit does the work for you. They can't let it go. You know how I know? Because when I was an addict and somebody told me Jesus Christ set him free, I couldn't let it go. It stuck in my head like a 16-penny nail. I couldn't shake it. Every time I got high, I would just snag on it all the time. Hear it in the back of my head, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the Holy Ghost started to work on my life. And I began to desire freedom from the sins in my life. Freedom from the drugs. The Samaritan woman's invitational approach. John 4, 28 through 30. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town. This is the second part of that story. And she said to the people, hey, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and they went their way toward him. Then we have Dorsus. Dorsus service approach. Acts 9:36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorsa, who was always doing good and helping the poor. What is your approach and when do you use it? What are your giftings? Listen, I'm an encourager. Amen. That's one of my giftings. I am blessed in the ability to build people up. Nothing makes me happier. Nothing gives me more joy than to pour into a broken life. Nothing satisfies me more than to pour into a broken heart. I gotta be full to do it. Healing. What are your giftings? Is there healing for others? Is it a physical healing? Is it a spiritual healing? Is it a mental healing that you have the ability to operate in? Deliverance? Were you delivered? Are you one the Holy Ghost uses to deliver others? Are you in bondage? Are you one that's used to bring others into bondage? Think about it. Are you an encourager, someone who builds up, leads by example? Just use the tools that God's given you. Use your giftings and abilities to minister to those around you. Be confident. Not in yourself. Okay? Don't be confident in yourself. Paul said, I boast in Christ alone. Be confident in Christ. He's called you. He's anointed you. He has appointed you 
for such a time as this? Do you think it's any mistake that you were saved at this time in history? No. It's no mistake. Sorry. The AC is pranking in here. That's that new air conditioner. Hallelujah. Things working good. Thank you, Lord, for the AC. Be confident in Christ and what Christ has done for you. If you love the world and the systems of the world, it tells us that God's love is not in us. We need to love the things of God and have a hatred towards the things of the world, a disdain towards the things of the world. Why do we hate things like drugs? Because of what they do to people. You don't hate the person. Love the person. Recognize the bondage. Recognize the pain and the hurt that's there. Look beyond. So we're so quick to look at the surface and just begin to judge people based on the, I can't believe they would say that. I, I can't believe they, listen, I can. I can. I can understand it completely. Why wouldn't they? They don't know any better. Because they've never been told. They've never been shown. They've never seen there's a way out. They don't understand there's a way out. They feel like they're stuck. So many people committing suicide. So many people giving up on life. So many people hopeless and helpless and depressed and broken and empty. They need the gospel. They need Jesus. They need him. They might not even know they need him. They might not even want him. But listen, a little bit of salt over time, a little bit of light over time, the light of the Holy Spirit will begin to shine through you on them. And they'll say, man, I want that. <clears throat> I need that. I gotta have that. You gotta be contagious. This is a critical issue of church. Oftentimes we make our attacks against people. And we wind up hurting people and driving them away from God. We're called to be salt and light to bring them to God. Too much salt, it ain't a good thing. I told you about the salt infusion. Too much light, not a good thing. Too much light will blind people. It's overwhelming. Blinds them. We don't want to blind people. Oftentimes, a bright, bright, bright light only burns for so long. Be careful. We're not burning so brightly, we're burning out. Consistency. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. If we're not bright enough, we can't shine light on what needs to be, on what needs to change. Love the people. Hate the sin. Amen. Live in the world. But don't compromise your walk. Don't compromise your integrity. Don't drop down who you are. Set apart. Separate from. Right? Oil and water don't mix. Too much salt, not a good thing. Too much light, you blind people. Love the sin. Hate the sin. Amen. 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 Amen.